Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. And during the talk, there were also a few questions already. I think I overlooked your hand raised after the previous talk, but I guess hopefully you can also exchange the questions uh, using the chat uh, function. Uh, let me start with the first question that was posted by Kurt Kremer. Actually, he has two questions. So question 1A, in your polymer fingerprint in space, you have to introduce a metric for the distance since very different properties are considered. How do you determine the metric and how sensitive are the results? I guess that was both questions in one. Oh, there's a second one also. So how, how do you determine the metric and how sensitive are the results? Okay, great. Uh, so nice question. Um, so the fingerprint has many, many components to begin with. And just a subset of uh, that uh, large fingerprint uh, components would actually be relevant for a given property. And different properties will require different subsets of the fingerprint components or features. So there are many ways to determine uh, which subset would be relevant for a particular property. One uh, algorithm, simple algorithm that we use uh, goes under the name of recursive feature elimination. So we basically develop a model with the entire set of fingerprints and then we throw away uh, features one at a time and see if the performance of the model improves uh, or, or is preserved, right? In this, in this systematic manner, you can actually find a compact representation for a given property of interest. So this procedure is done uh, again and again for, uh, for various properties. So different properties at the end of the day will have different representations in fingerprint space, right? So this is one way to do it. Uh, there are many other ways to uh, solve this problem. Uh, the recursive feature elimination approach is something we've used a fair amount. And, um, and also the other thing, the other nice thing about this approach is that you end up with a, a compact fingerprint uh, component, set of components uh, that also tell you something physically about the, about the material, about the, about the polymers and, and the corresponding property, right? Which of the, which features of the polymer are actually affecting that particular property is something that you get out of this procedure. Okay, thank you very much. And I guess there's also question number 1B, uh, again by Kurt Kremer. Do you have an experimental example where the genetic algorithm predicts a new polymer with the desired properties? I guess experimental proof of what you've predicted. Another great question. Uh, it's always good to have proofs like that, right? Uh, so uh, within the genetic algorithm and the VAE context, uh, we do have some designs that are currently being considered on the experimental side, but because of this COVID situation, things have slowed down, right? Uh, but then it's in the works. We have, uh, we have some designs that are actually in the process of being validated. Uh, so that is for the genetic and the, and the, and the uh, generative algorithm-based designs. But we have actually um, several examples of, uh, of uh, predictions that were made computationally and through informatics, through machine learning methods that have already been uh, sort of validated in the lab, uh, not through the genetic or the generative algorithms, but other algorithms, other, other methods uh, that have actually been validated. And we've already published a few of those and, the, and, and these examples fall under the energy storage application domain. So there have already been some examples of things that came out of the comput uh, computational lab to the experimental lab and validate. I see, thank you very much. So I have another question, but I, I first hand over to Matthias. Okay. Yeah, so we have one question by Luca Gringelli, but in fact, but before we, we, we put him on, let me actually just tell you one thing because some people have asked me, uh, so when people raise the hand, uh, we can only really uh, let them talk. Uh, showing also their picture is actually somewhat uh, involved in Zoom. So, so that's why you don't see the person. But in fact, uh, Luca, you have seen yesterday in this talk. Uh, so Luca Giringelli, your question. Okay, so I put my shirt for nothing. I could stay <laughs> in pajamas. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, hi, Rampi. Uh, it was very inspiring, as always, from you. And I have a specific question on, um, on the variational atom encoder. Um, so to my understanding, the uh, usefulness eventually 
uh, is in uh, uh, encoded in the in the way you represent uh, high dimensionally your system, so the 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 the, the coded part. So you're using smiles for the polymers, and uh, so we wish we would have uh, smiles also for um, other problems in in material science. But even if you stay with the uh, organic molecules. Is there any feeling that these smiles are representing everything so that one is not leaving out something possibly interesting and then you are this completely lost in this, uh, in the, with this approach? Great question, Luca. Uh, nice to hear from you. Um, so, um, yeah, so getting the VAE to work, pro work properly is a big challenge. And uh, I'm actually teaming up with, uh, with a colleague of computer science, colleague of mine, Lee Song, here at Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that Lee has pioneered is this thing called the syntax directed VAE. So uh, we basically impart uh, grammar and semantics information to the VAE upfront. Basically what that means is that we teach the VAE some chemistry so that it can only create molecules or uh, uh, polymer fragments, uh, polymer repeat units that make chemical sense. Uh, synthetic feasibility is a separate question which we are considering, which uh, you know, we have not properly addressed yet. But at the very least, we want the VAE to only be dealing with structures that are chemically meaningful, right? And in order to do that, we have to do a fair amount of this unsupervised learning training upfront uh, of the syntax directed variational autoencoder. So this was a very critical exercise, especially for polymers, uh, because you know, polymers need to satisfy other constraints over and above what regular organic molecules, small molecules need to satisfy. So we needed to actually do that training before we could get anything meaningful out of the VAE. So it was a highly non-trivial uh, exercise. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Especially you address also the synthesizability that was actually my next question, but thank you already. <laughs> two, two answers in one. Thank you. Okay, maybe um, we have a little bit of time, not very much, but there are st still three questions that I would like to pose. So maybe we can do this uh, quickly. There's one question by the next speaker, actually, Andrew Ferguson. Um, and the question is, do you have an understanding for why the GPR approach to polymer solvent prediction failed, whereas the ANN approach was successful? Okay, uh, so uh, the GPR approach did not really fail. Um, it's just that the data, as, the, as your data set size increases, one has to look for the appropriate algorithm. So uh, for the solvent problem, we had 24 different solvents and, and, and we had uh, 5,000 5, polymers, right? And for each polymer, we had an idea of which of these 24 solvents were solvents and non-solvents, right? So the data set size was pretty big. And so we could, of course, uh, have done the same thing with GPR. Uh, it's just that it would have been slower. Um, so it's just efficiency, right? Um, so if the efficiency factor was not there, one could, one could pursue the uh, uh, GPR or a variant of the GPR approach. <laughs> I have one last question that we should uh, uh, answer maybe quickly. And if there are more questions, then I guess this can be dealt with by email. Um, and this question is by Kanisha Singh, Kanishka Singh. I saw an article using GNN's graph neural nets for polymer pr property prediction. What are your thoughts on graphs for large molecules such as polymers and macromolecules? I think it's a great uh, viable direction to pursue. Uh, in fact, we are also thinking along those lines uh, because one of the one of the big challenges, which I really did not mention in, in, in my in the main part of my presentation, is representation. Representation is everything. At the end of the day, representation is really the most critical thing, right? The fingerprinting or whatever you call it, picturization or the representation. So the graph-based approach is uh, perhaps a very viable direction. There are challenges with that, uh, but perhaps uh, that can take us to the next level. So I am very optimistic and positive uh, about the graph neural network based approach for this problem, this class of problems. Okay. Well, thank you very much again, and uh, also for answering all those questions.